Hi. Thank you so much. It's funny that like nobody sat in the front row, but then you guys just became the front row because you're one back. It's a very cozy atmosphere we have, isn't it? I mean, no. <laughs> it's like a really wide, weird room. I feel like and uh, like... and like light. I wouldn't say cozy, but I would say thank you so much for giving up your time and coming to hear us chatting. We would do well to have like a little fireplace here or. Yes. A comedically oversized fish tank. <laughs> and maybe drinks. Ah, that's yeah. doable. Yeah. Can that happen. Um, OK, great. Thanks so much for joining us today. Of course. Your book is amazing. Everybody should read it. It's fantastic. Thanks, um, Kelly. Yeah, but I want to chat with you a little bit about um, your home life and where you came from. Um, sure. So you've made the rounds um, from a comedian to an actress to a writer. Um, <laughs> And you write a lot. In like if something doesn't work out, then I just go. <laughs> uh, you write a lot in your book about your home life in Cove and how that yes. influenced you. So can you mm -hmm. tell the audience a little bit about where you come from and what your family's like? Yeah, so I'm from a place in Ireland called Cove. I, is there any other Irish people here today? Oh, you, oh my god, that's cool. So you know Cove? Yeah, so it's like down, down south, and it's, um, it's actually a big emigration town, which I've been thinking about recently because it like relates to my work here, because I grew up from where in where everybody left from, like a million people left from Cove. This is a long time ago. It's like during the famine, which is now over. Obviously, we're fine. Um, I'm actually really full, um, but I grew up there. I'm one of eight children, which is maybe a little bit more than the norm. I would say, like we still have big families in Ireland, but. It is a lot and very happy childhood. And uh, but I do think that's where like my obsession with immigration started because we learned about it in school all the time, even to like inappropriate levels where like I remember learning about like maritime tragedies of like the boats leaving Cove and crashing. And then this one local historian came into us and said, um, the people would be clinging on to the side of the boats and, and the other people would be chopping their hands off. And I was like, <laughs> maybe seven. <laughs> And I don't know that that's ever been verified. Like, anyway, so <laughs> always in my mind, it was like, oh, I'm from this place where people leave from. Um, and so, and I write a bit about that. And I write about Annie Moore, who I've been thinking about these days so much, because she's the first immigrant through the gates of Ellis Island. She left from my hometown of Cove in like 18, it was like the 150th anniversary. I can't really do the, it was like 1898 or something, mm -hmm. I think. Is that right? 150? No, I'm not I don't know. <laughs> anyway, it was like 150 years ago. And she was an unaccompanied minor. She was 17 years old. She left with her two baby brothers. So three unaccompanied kids coming across, no documents, no passport, no visa, nothing. And they were welcomed in and they were reunited with their parents who had come here years earlier to like make you know get an apartment and like start to make a living they lived on the Lower East Side for the rest of their lives and like I just think how different it was for them compared to what's happening to kids today mm -hmm. and just all the various you know issues of race and stuff around that. Yeah. You also lived in Zimbabwe as a child. I did live in Zimbabwe yeah so any Zimbabweans here? <laughs> no? What are you nodding your head? Like you're you are? Oh, you're like, as if there'd be Zimbabweans here. <laughs> it's, a, it's an unfortunate comparison between Irish and... Right. Irish. True. Very true. So much easier for white immigrants from Europe to get here than it is from black immigrants from Zimbabwe. In fact, I, uh, yeah, I have a friend at the moment who's trying to get the O-1 visa, which is the one I'm on, which is the alien of extraordinary ability. He, he's like a, won this big film festival in Zimbabwe two years ago. I was on a hidden camera show in Ireland. <laughs> like, so anyway, he <laughs> technically is probably more extraordinary than I am. Um, but it's proving a lot more difficult. And uh, so anyway, we lived in Zimbabwe. The whole family went and lived there for two years. My dad was in construction. He was building a hotel over there. Um, and I think that was a really valuable um, experience for me. Just from, if any of you have kids, I don't have any kids that I know of. It's like a terrible joke. Um, <laughs> shaking your head. 
You're like, a Google executive would never say that. <laughs> Kelly and I were talking earlier and she normally has to interview Google executives, or not Google executives. Like executives generally. Executives generally. Um, None of whom I hope watch this. <laughs> no, but I mean, they're great, but I mean, they wouldn't make terrible jokes. They're better. That's oh. better. They wouldn't be like, I don't have any kids that I know of <laughs> in like that dumb voice. Well, I think that's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, what I was going to say is like, if you do have kids, I really think it's cool to like, if you can at all, and it's a hugely privileged thing to be able to do, mm -hmm. to move country and have them live somewhere else when they're small. Yeah. So that they can understand they're not the center of the world, them and everyone who looks like them, because in Ireland, everyone is very, um, I mean, like, look. <laughs> you can make a few sisters. Um, and so it's really, it was a great thing for me to go away and see, like, oh, here's all these other ways of living, basically. Yeah, and yeah. you write about growing up in a family where humor was prized above all else. Um, so how did that affect you as a child? Can you tell the audience about your family? And yeah, I mean, I think, I don't know if it's like a big family thing, if it's an Irish thing, but certainly being funny in my family was, you know, no one cared if you were athletic or clever or being funny was like the thing mm -hmm. that, that that was, you know, and, and it wasn't just like nice funny, you know, often there's like an edge to humor and that's definitely the way my family is where you kind of sit around the table and you're a little bit scared and then it like starts and um, it's tough, but it's like you show your affection for people by like, bullying them. <laughs> um, <laughs> I grew up in the same kind of family and I'm curious if that's the experience of a lot of other Irish people in the audience. I mean, everyone's too nervous to yeah. put their hands up because they've I been bullied so badly. Shy. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So you. But what? How many are in your family? Oh, it's small, just two. But I've got loads of cousins, like. Dozens. Yes. Yeah, I would definitely count our cousins and even our aunts. And my aunts still give me a really hard time, and yeah, it's just never ending. But I mean, I think that's good if you end up working as a comedian the way I did. But also, I would say at least two of my six sisters are funnier than I am. Mm -hmm. Like Rosie, my sister, who still lives in Cove where we grew up, and she's a beautician in Cove. And she is like, first of all, she knows all the town secrets because she does all their waxing and, you know, and then, and eyebrows and everything. And then she's a really good impressionist. Uh -huh. And she's just like so sharp and funny, but she doesn't have like a compulsion to show off about it like some so of us do. When did you realize that being funny was your superpower? Oh, well, I'm not being self-deprecating when I say I'm not good at anything else. Like I'm good at writing and I'm good at being funny and doing those two things together. But I didn't realize the writing thing until about like five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I still need a lot of outside, um, you know, what, like proof of that. Mm -hmm. Like, now I'm like, I write for the New York Times. That has to be, mean something, you know? Yeah, validation. validation. Mm -hmm. But with being funny, I was always like, I'm funny. Yeah. Even though in school and everything, I was quiet. But like, I was like the kind of uh, judgmental outsider one. And also I think being female, it's harder to be overtly like, I'm the funniest one in the room. You're more sly about it. Uh -huh. And um, so that's, that's kind of what I always have known. Yeah, well, it's used to great effect. So um, you. your writing has been compared to if David Sedaris and Tina Fey had a daughter, which I think is perfect. I mean, that's what's on the cover of the book. I know, isn't that beautiful? But and it's so also, accurate. don't you think it's kind of grotesque? Because <laughs> Tina Fey and David Sedaris wouldn't have a daughter. Also, like, obviously David Sedaris is a gay man and wouldn't have, you know, a child with a straight woman. And she is not that much older than me. If you could update it she... to fan fiction of who you would like to have a daughter. No, I'd love them to be my parents. Sure. But I just think in, in, in the natural order of things, it would be highly unusual to have a 13-year-old mother and a kind of an older gay man be my be my parent. I guess I see where you're coming from. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I know. You but can. it's, you know, Glamour magazine said it and then we were all really happy because it's like hard to get good quotes. 
So we were like, yeah, put it up there. Yeah. So who do you look to for writing inspiration? For writing inspiration, I mean, I definitely, I tend to read lots of non-fiction books about war. <laughs> um, so, but for funny writing, um, I do love David Sedaris, actually. Daddy. And... <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, God, I'm yeah. trying to think now. Well, I'm interested in hearing about the war books as well. Do they influence? Yeah, I don't know that they that they influence my writing. I mean, like, I certainly I write here about when I went to Iraq and I did a workshop in Iraq and. I definitely didn't want to be one of those people who come from the West and like land there and spend a few weeks there and, you know, go on about like, oh, the sound of the mosque, you know, in the early morning or, you know, mm -hmm. the usual crap that like, I feel like white Western people write when they go anywhere there, you know, or they're like, actually the people were friendly, you know, this kind of, I hate yeah. that. Yeah. So maybe it was helpful to me that I do read, you know, um, there's a really, I think like my favorite book of the last few years is called like, uh, No, what's it called again? I told you I'm so dozy today. It's a book about Afghanistan and it's an American who went to live in Afghanistan and uh, Anand Gopal is the writer's name. It's called like No Country for, or like No Good Country for the Living or something. Can you Google it? <laughs> <laughs> can, can you Google it? <laughs> it's like everyone who make that joke. Uh, no good place for the, no good country for the living or something like that? No Sorry. No reception. Um, anyway, it's a really cool book because basically he was, he's a, I think he was like a neuroscientist, young, you know, just studying neuroscience. And then he was downtown when the World Trade Center attacks happened and he was like stuck under a car all day. And like that made him think suddenly about like America's place in, in the world and about geopolitics in the way that he hadn't before. And then he just decided to move to Afghanistan and he lived there, you know, and he learned the language and he like got a motorbike and traveled around and had access to like even one member of the Taliban. And so he just learned so much and then he wrote about it in a way that was um, so informative about like what really happened there and what the American, you know, why it's such a mess. And he also has these really great human stories. He traces like three people, one a Taliban commander, one is a widow who ended up in parliament. And then he just, the, the combination of, um, you know, a news story deeply researched and like on the ground and also the human, um, both the human cost and the human opportunity because both of those things happen in a war, obviously. Yeah. Um, so I loved his writing. And I would say then when I am writing about Iraq or I also went to Iran, then I try and think there's only so much you can, un, you know, be aware of your own biases or whatever. But I'm always trying to think like, what if I didn't grow up in Ireland and didn't live in America? Like, what would I really be thinking or like, what's really happening? That's helpful. Yeah. I certainly see a lot of ties to that in your journalism. So your podcast and the articles that you write for the New York Times, that makes total sense. Where mm -hmm. do you find your reading recommendations around those issues? Um, I mean, I'm, I definitely have a lot of like uh, immigrant journalists that I follow and that, uh, you know, it's not hard to find, you know, it's not hard to find good, interesting work written by like, if I'm going to read about the Mexican-American border, I want to read it from a Mexican point of view, too. Like, very simple. <laughs> There's very simple ways to, I think, inform yourself. Yeah. Um, and, like, it is kind of amazing. It is kind of amazing when you realize, like, oh, the different the points of view that I'm getting there, you know, you just need to scratch the surface a bit and look a bit deeper. Mm -hmm. um, I bet a lot of the audience hasn't had a chance to read the book yet, and I'd love to give them an insight into what you did in Iraq. If you could tell them Oh, sure. That. So I did a comedy workshop. <laughs> I'm talking all about Warrens, but I did a comedy workshop. And uh, I went there in 2016, and I was in Erbil, which is, you know, um, up in Kurdistan, and uh, it's like a very safe place, but I did tell my parents that I was going to Kurdistan. I didn't specify like Iraq. And then I, you know, 
I got two other comics to come with me. Well, one is, he's a TV writer, um, he, Joe Randazzo, his name is, and uh, he used to write for The Onion, and, th and then he wrote for At Midnight and a few different places. And then Mo Ammer, who's um, a Texan comedian who tours with Dave Chappelle, but he's Texan by way of, like, his family are Palestinian and he's Arabic speaking. So the three of us went out there and we did a workshop with 40 of our Iraqi peers. And they, um, you know, I was obviously like a bit hesitant about like coming from America to like teach like the history of American involvement in Iraq has never been good. And then also to be like, hey, we're gonna like, don't you think jokes are so important, you know? Um, and to teach like comedy or whatever, but, uh, I did my research. I also like coming from Ireland, as you know, we, you know, we were a conflict ridden country for a long time. And I was definitely, I'm definitely too young to claim that story as my own. But certainly when I used to do gigs in Belfast, I remember the um, owner of the Empire, the comedy club up there, he said that whenever there was a very bad atrocity, that that Sunday night for the comedy show, there would be like lines around the block mm -hmm. and the people really used comedy as a way to come together and as kind of a form of relief and a, and a way to like connect with each other. And um, I always found that really interesting. Plus like in Northern Ireland, I think it's fair to say they have like a slightly darker hue to their humor. Um, and so going to Iraq, I kind of had that in my mind. And I also wanted to talk about, you know, the, the um, power of creativity when you're in, in, you know, going through dark stuff, mm -hmm. whether that's just yourself or it's your family or it's, it could be your community or country. Um, but that's all very lofty. I was really nervous. And then I got there and of course it was like doing a comedy workshop anywhere. Like there was, you know, four women <laughs> and 36 men. And like, um, there was, you know, like goofy loud guys who were just wanted to do comedy to meet women and then there was uh like older like earnest men who kind of were had always wanted to express this side to themselves but they were you know working or looking after family it was just like i could have named people's equivalent like that i had met in new zealand in edinburgh in dublin do you know what i mean absolutely it was cool and like um there was cartoonists there and people who made short videos and um Stand-up comedy is like a, a younger kind of a craft mm. uh, in Iraq and it was a lot of, there was a sketch group there and stuff and we just had this workshop and it was, it was, it was really good. Like it was really um, helpful, I think, for, it was certainly helpful for me. Now I hope it was helpful for them too. And I'm still in touch with uh, a few people that took the workshop and what was extraordinary was, you know, we were just like, 40 miles from Mosul, which was still under ISIS, ISIS control at the time. And um, they were making like funny videos about ISIS. And like that was kind of the, you know, ISIS are so good at uh, social media and at, 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 you know, making videos that travel. Um, I think that for the people at the workshop, some of whose family, they were IDPs, so their family were still stuck in Mosul. Um, I think it was useful for them to have a comeback and to use, to you know, use their creativity to oppose this kind of destruction that, and this narrative of destruction. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what they said, and I think, and I do believe them actually. And I also, I also was like, God, I was so stupid coming out here thinking, oh, what's the point of this? Because I was like, well, if I just happened to grow up here, I'd be the one in the workshop. Like, you know, I'd be one of those kind of like girls being like, is this gonna be good, <laughs> you know? You mentioned uh, the impulse for self-expression. So if you were a cave woman, you would be the one who's writing on the walls. Totally, I'm constantly, as you could see, like trying to say like, trying to figure out what, what I'm thinking and feeling and how I understand things and trying to share that. And it's just, uh, I think it's very human. Maybe it's like a bit stronger in some of us than in others. But I think it's a very human impulse to try and say, like, to just express yourself and then to get heard is amazing. Yeah, well, we all reap the benefits of you expressing yourself. So thank you for that. <laughs> uh, You're so welcome.
<laughs> so teaching this comedy workshop opened up a lot of questions about the shared space between comedy and tragedy. And I'm going to mm -hmm. read a little um, excerpt of a question that you posed, which is, okay. what if comedy and creativity, these nebulous things I've devoted all these years to, are, in fact, in the grand scheme of things, unhelpful or even pointless? So how did your experience help to clarify those questions? Um, and do you still ever struggle with them? Um, I think, you know, a lot of times comedy, like I think that we pat ourselves on the back too much. Like I think, you know, if you're on the kind of left side of things, you like watch John Oliver and you're like, yeah, like get him, like you said it, or, or John Stewart or whatever. Mm -hmm. And ultimately I don't think it's really, I don't think, if your goal is to change things, I don't think that's changing things. It's like you get a laugh and you feel good, but, and you definitely get that sense, that, like we're a tribe, but like that's, <laughs> I don't know how helpful that is. Um, so, but for when I went and spent that time in Iraq, I do think that I could see the value of it from a kind of a, just a, it's an important part of being human. And I think often when people are serious all the time, even if it's because they're sad or because something bad is happening, I think that's a disservice to their own like humanity. Mm -hmm. Because I think in all of us, there's like light and dark and there's levity and there's depth. And like, unless you allow both of them to come out, then it's like, you're not being fair. It's like if you were like giddy and, uh, upbeat all the time that's not a true like representation of, of what you know really being a human yeah so that's why I think you know a lot of narratives around you know of course like around war and of course around m immigration like forced immigration like what's happening to Syrians are so tragic and so sad but within those stories which I found in my podcast when I like, interviewed Syrian asylum seekers like there's there's jokes, there's love, there's humor, you know, there's all those things that like people who aren't in a war and people who don't um, feel a great sadness, like they still get to have, they still get to have that levity. Yeah. But I think it gets lost in the telling sometimes. Yeah. What made you choose to do a podcast on immigration? Well, I think it was because you know, like I was saying, where I came from was, you know, Ireland is such a country that just pushes people out all the time. And we end up all over the world. And then I became an immigrant myself, like moved here five years ago. And I could definitely see the contrast between my immigration experience and so many other people's. And it was definitely a question of like, hmm, like why me? And like, why not them? And why not, th you know, because America is such a fortress, really. Um, so, and also, so there was that, there was just that central question of like, what's really going on here? But also immigration stories, as you know, if you're an immigrant yourself or if you're no immigrants, like there's always a story there because it, it literally means you have left one life behind and you've come and started a new life. And that is like, from a storytelling point of view, there has to be something there. Mm -hmm. Even in like the most boring immigration story, there is a story, there's a, there's a beginning and a middle and then what's happened now. Yeah, the podcast is no longer in production, but the back mm -hmm. issues are amazing. And if you haven't listened to it, you really should. It hits all the right notes. Oh, thank you. To change Kelly. hearts and minds. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, you say that it, it changed hearts and minds, but like it's interesting because I really thought, like, so basically the, the podcast is quite simple. It's like me interviewing different immigrants about their own stories. It's like immigration stories told by the people who've lived them. And I really thought, like, you know, we went into production in, you know, 2015. Well, I started the idea working on 2015 and then, but the way the timing worked, you know, the, the show only started airing like right after uh, Trump got elected. And then I think he was inaugurated while I was still taping on the West Coast. Anyway, and so obviously, the, you know, the immigration is always a huge topic here in America, but it had really heated up. Um, and I think I did naively probably think, oh, but if anybody hears this, like if they hear, you know, uh, Zaza, the Syrian asylum seeker, if they talk, if they hear him talking about like how he really needs to quit smoking because 
he has this one-year-old now and his wife is giving him a hard time. And yeah, he wants to quit smoking, but he's afraid he's going to put weight on because he's like a comfort eater, you know. Like, he, he reminded me of my uncle. And I was like, when they hear him, they're not going to be scared of Syrians and, like, they're not going to even consider a Muslim ban or whatever. But, you know, I, I don't know that uh, hearing stories from immigrants directly does change hearts and minds. <laughs> I like to hope that it does. I, I hope that it does too, but I, I, it's hard to get that qualitative, like, does it actually? Yeah. I don't know. I, I, it's a really, I'm still trying to figure out. Yeah, I think reaching the correct audience is probably the hardest part of the battle. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's an innate tension um, in the whole book about the hope you have for humanity, uh, society, and um, the insecurity of the self that everybody faces. Um, so can you uh, give us any words of wisdom for people in the audience who might want to make a difference in the world and contribute to change, but uh, need the courage to start? Well, I mean, I could say what I'm doing like at the moment, which is like kind of a small thing, but it's actually like helping me. But so like um, I started this other podcast this year and it's about uh, climate justice, which is something I never I knew about, but I wasn't really like paying attention anyway. I uh, we did this issue. We did this episode about divestment, you know, like big, big countries or corporations or universities or whatever, divesting their money from, say, like fossil fuel funding of fossil fuel operations to putting it into something else, like clean energy or something that's kind of, you know, whatever, cleaner and better for the environment and, and better from a human rights point of view and stuff. And so then we did this whole episode and I was kind of like, OK, cool, like you can petition your your government to divest, which interests the great news is I, the Irish government has recently divested all of their money, which is amazing. Um, but then I was like, looked at Chase Bank, which is just like where I bank for no reason, except that that's where I opened up a bank account. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then I was like, oh, I'm going to move my money. <laughs> at the, this is like last week, I was on the phone to them and it I owed them four grand. Like I had like zero in my current account and minus a minus four grand in my credit card. <laughs> so I was like taking a high moral step. I was I phoned them and I was like, I think I'm gonna leave the bank because I've been reading all this stuff and like you you've you've been funding this huge tar sands project and you know and the lady was like, You you can't leave like you owe us. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, no, I know, but, you know, I'm telling you, like, um, anyway, then, because the day your book gets pub published, you get your check or whatever. So I got my check on Tuesday, was it? Or, yeah. And then I was like, you know, Julia Roberts, kind of, you know, that moment where she goes back into the shop and she's like, big mistake. <laughs> but still, the woman in Chase is like, fine, you can leave. Like, they were just like, what is your problem? <laughs> anyway, so, uh, and then like this other lady, cause I was like, I should record this. Like, it's really funny. And this other lady, first of all, I called Chase and I was like, now I have money and I'm paying off my credit card and you're not getting the rest of my money or whatever. And then it's like a lady who works in a call center in the Philippines, you know? And I wasn't about to like go off on her you know, mm -hmm. do you know what you're doing? Like, climate change is a real problem. She's in the Philippines. Like, I think she knows. And uh, we had a really nice chat, actually. And she was like, look, I'm going to do my homework after this. And I was like, OK, sorry to keep you on the phone. And um, <laughs> then I got put through to media relations because I was recording or whatever. And she hung up on me, this lady in, like, the Manhattan branch hung up on me. So anyway, this is, I'm sorry, this is a really long-winded way of saying mm -hmm. I'm personally taking responsibility for like this is like the a small thing right mm -hmm. where my money goes I also um you know when it comes to immigration I try and really look at my own status which like I said is I have this 01 visa which is a very privileged one to get and I try and help other people get it mm -hmm. and I just try and speak to and understand other points of view it's very basic. Mm -hmm. Like that's like I said when I started the podcast, I was like, 
my responsibility as a storyteller is to change the attitude towards immigration in this country. And it's like, no, mm -hmm. I can't do that. Like what I can do personally, really do is like these small things. I can, you know, another thing which is more, again, climate justice related is like, check where my food comes from and not just like order seamless all the time, yeah. which is like a lot of packaging and yeah. a lot of, you know, very, so I'm doing very small things. Yeah. That's like my latest approach. Yeah, so I'm hearing start small and speak to your talents because you've leveraged your talents in incredible ways to affect change. Um, I want to leave space for audience questions. Sure. So please don't be shy if you want to uh, ask something. Um, we've got microphones. You could ask me for a loan. That was a good time. <laughs> 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 um, but also, um, this book was uh, completed about a year ago, is that right? Yeah, I basically finished it last September, so and then it's quite a long process with publishing. It takes a while. What's changed in your life since then? Um, I got a dog. <laughs> I got a dog. I got made a columnist at the Times and at the Guardian. Mm -hmm and also at The Progressive, another magazine. So suddenly now I have a lot of writing work to do, um, which is fine. Um, and I think that's kind of it. Yeah, but that's big. You have a really cute passage about, so many cute passages about dogs in this book. <laughs> well, it. you see, because I used to always walk um, dogs from Sean Casey. It's like a, set, a rescue place. And you can walk dogs from there. Like you don't have to, I mean, really, you just go in and give your email address. I think they kind of want you just to take them. Um, and then you can take the dog to the park or whatever. And I used to always do that. And I was like, I can't get a dog, you know, like but, but, with money and like looking at the time and everything. But then I just kind of, got, you know, I don't know if you have a dog, but like what happens is you act like you're just going to foster it for a while. Anyway, I end up getting this dog full time now for almost <laughs> and uh and it's great like actually when i got her i was like she's she, she's like half border collie so i was like she's going to be real busy and energetic and she's going to make me start running again so i used to run i don't run anymore and then um i was like it's going to be so good for me and my mental health and i'm going to like lose weight and everything she's also half period anyway she's like the laziest not lazy <laughs> but like She's a puppy and she's just like, let's snooze. So she, yeah, so that's what's happened to me. Quite large for a puppy. She's a big puppy, yeah, she's 60 pounds now because she just sleeps all the time. I'll do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we covered your trip to Iraq and mentoring Iraqi comics um, and all the issues that come up for you. And my, my dog. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we hit all the big ones. Um, around the role and utility of comedy and its relationship to tragedy. Mm -hmm. um, there's this really interesting um, juxtaposition in the book about your hope for all of these comics and how they can affect change and um, being very uh, positive and optimistic about um, the role of comedy and politics in Iraq. Um, but I saw a lot of um, insecurity bubbling up around the podcast and its, uh, its ability to affect change in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, and imposter syndrome is something that we talk about a lot at Google. It's a big discussion mm -hmm. point. Um, so do you have any words of wisdom about kind of closing that gap between how you perceive other people and how you can uh, bring your own self-perception to the same place? Yeah, I mean, I... This, this newest prod podcast that I'm working on is with Mary Robinson, who's the former president of Ireland. She's our first female president. And she's 73 years old now. And so you can imagine what it was like for her coming up as a, she was a human rights lawyer first in like this, I guess the, I guess the 70s in Ireland, which was a tough time for like women. And she was like a human rights lawyer. So anyway, I asked her about that. Cause I think it's like a, real phenomenon with younger women. Mm -hmm. I, maybe men feel it too, imposter syndrome. I hear it most from women, but maybe men feel it too. Um, and I asked her about it and she was like, I never had it. <laughs> she was so unhelpful. Like, I really thought that she, she'd she have some kind of like w wise and she was just like, no, I don't know. <laughs> um, and someone else, that I talked to about this, she's a black woman, and she was like, that I don't have time for, like, she's like, everyone does doubt me. Everyone in her 
I guess she means not, not black people, mm -hmm. does doubt her and she does have to prove herself mm -hmm. all of the time. So if she also doubts herself, so that made me think, this is just one black woman, I don't know if that's, you know, but that made me think like, hmm, like I wonder if it's a bit of a, making a problem where there isn't one. Um, but I feel it, it's a real, you know, and I know like feelings aren't facts, but whatever, I do still feel it a bit myself. Yeah. And I feel like, what, you know, what do I think I'm doing here? Or if I'm doing like a high status thing or whatever, I'm like, me? Um, I think it's helpful to uh, remind yourself of past, like using logic helps me. Like I can say to myself, but you did this other thing like two weeks ago and that was on the same level and you did fine. So like use, using logic to say like, I wasn't caught out then, nobody kicked me out then. Mm -hmm. So like I can do this again. Yeah. And then I use that for a lot of things to trick my brain. Like I often think, oh, I'm not gonna be able to write this piece. Like it's too hard or it's too long or it's whatever, I don't time. But then I think, but you thought that before, but you did it. So just using evidence from your past. <laughs> That's amazing. I mean, we're a very data-based company. It should resonate for us. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much for joining us at Google today. Um, Maven America, Essays by a Girl from Somewhere Else is now available. Uh, pick it up on Google Play. We have copies in the back. Um, hopefully, maybe we'll be around Ellie. to sign some copies as well. Sure. Yeah, um, but thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Kelly. Mm -hmm. Um, didn't you, yeah, you, you asked such good questions too. Thank you. Yeah, like you really read the book. I was doing radio interviews this week. You wouldn't, you don't know. I was doing radios this week, radio interviews, and some people were like, oh, Mauve, so great to talk to, you know, anyway. I'm just in it for the compliments. <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions? Yeah, go ahead. No, but you're, there are other spellings, more complicated ways to spell my name, but luckily this was the, the ones my parents gave me. I know another Maeve, she's like, M-A-E-D-H-B-H. -H. <laughs> and people are just like, ah, Mehedetab. <laughs> so I, this, this is like kind of phonetic. You know, like people definitely call me Maeve, um, but I answer to, that's fine, like. Mauve is my worst because I don't like that color. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm just like, what? <laughs> but I do answer to Mauve. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Um, are you are you gonna are you done now with stand up and let's say improv? Are you gonna focus on writing or do you, could you see yourself going back to that at some stage? Um, I mean, I still do bits of stand up. Like, definitely writing is eighty percent or 90% probably now of my time and stuff. But I do a show every Monday in Brooklyn with my friends, uh, Parin and Anne Sherla and Joe Firestone, two very good comics. And we do a show there every Monday that kind of keeps my hand in. And I see all the youngsters coming up. <gasps> um, but I don't, but yeah, it is mainly writing now, right? Yeah, yeah. You have a lovely accent. <laughs> Cork as well. Where are you from? Dublin. Dublin. Donegal. Donegal. We have a good spread of Irish people here. Beautiful. Yeah. All right, thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, everyone.